Sales is just as much a science as it is an art. There's a lot of different things you can do to, one, make yourself more efficient as a salesperson, but two, also to understand the psychology behind sales and own those conversations that you're having. Yeah, I think there's a way that you can do things in a scalable manner while still adding like a high touch um, element. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm your host, Will Barron, and welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. On today's episode, we have Max Alshula, and he is the CEO of Sales Hacker, an organization and a community that puts on conferences for sales professionals. He is also the author of Hacking Sales, the ultimate playbook for building a high velocity sales machine. That is exactly what we're talking about today. What we can do as sales professionals to hack our process. So there's a lot of 80-20 analysis in this. There's marketing-esque style of uh, email communication from one to many which seemingly works incredibly well and it's something I need to experiment with myself. You can find all the show notes about everything we talk about, including the tools over at salesman.red. And without further ado, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Max, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. How you doing? Thanks for having me. You are more than welcome, sir. The first question I want to dive into, and we're going to jump in quickly and jump in deep, how much of success for the modern B2B sales pro is down to their ability to hack the sales process versus just how much time they're willing to spend, how much hustle they're going to put in and how much grit they're going to throw at it? Yeah, um, so I'd say it's a balance of both. Um, sales is just as much a science as it is an art. Um, you know, you have to be a good sales rep. You have to know how to talk to people. You have to know how to understand people. Um and I think in every layer of that, there's the hack, there's the science, there's the technology side of that. Um, you know, if you're just a, a really social person, that's great. You know, you'll probably do decent at sales. But if you take it a step further and read books on natural language, pro- like um, uh, NLP, um, so neuro linguistic programming, sorry, different NLP, neuro linguistic program, you read books on different types of psychology and how people interact, you read books on pricing, you read books. Uh, from like Dan Irelli and um, you know the other guys who I, I got to look at my book section over there, but other people who do these types types of things, you'll actually understand how people interact and be- the best ways to carry those conversations and you know the, the feel felt found type stuff and how to um, coach somebody through the sales process instead of um, hitting a wall. And so you know whether that's in the psychological side of things or the technological side of things. There's a lot of different things you can do to, one, make yourself more efficient as a salesperson, but two, also to understand the psychology behind sales and own those conversations that you're having. So you can be a really hard worker and you can be a really smooth talker, but if you pad yourself with everything else, if you, if you take advantage of the advancements and the enhancements um, that are happening in sales right now, you can be 10 times better, 100 times better, infinitely better. So and I just want to drill into that a bit further because I think this is an important point, Max. Um, and tell me if I'm wrong. Are you saying that you need, putting in the effort is, it, you have to put that in regardless. Everything else on top of that, all the hacks, and we'll talk about some of these today, they just uh, make the process more efficient, make closing deals quicker. But the, or, and, and tell me again if I'm wrong, or are you saying that you can, do more sales in less time with less effort by using certain tools. So they used to have a, a saying, uh, "Don't what is it? Don't work harder, work smarter, or work smarter, not harder." Um, I'd say you got to work smarter and harder. There's no reason why you can't do both. Um, the advancements in technology and the information that's out there for salespeople allows you to work smarter than ever before. Doesn't mean you have to work any less as, as hard as you were working before. But if you Com- like combine those two things, you're going to be so much more successful than you ever were before. And anybody else that's around you, you'll, you know, president's club, a hundred percent. Um, you know, you are, you will be the ultimate, you know, sales machine, the robot, the, you know, the Iron Man of sales. And does all this, uh, what we're going to talk about of, of hacking the process, does it all start with email? And what I mean by that is, in the world of sales in 2016, when you're prospecting is the first starting point, once you've defined your customer and all that kind of thing, is it to build a, a marketer-like 
email list that then you can start to work some of this science on? So you've defined your customer already. I think it all starts with, you know, um, account and contact intelligence. So, you know, you figure out, okay, I've defined my customer. My customer is X company. And the employees at that company that I need to contact are, you know, Y and Z and, you know, whoever else. Once you have that, then it's all about intelligence around those people that you can use when contacting them via email, phone, or social. I think, you know, however you set up your cadence, it really doesn't matter whether you email them first, call them first, tweet at them first, connect with them on LinkedIn. What does matter is um, doing that research, uh, gathering that intelligence on them, and then leveraging that in however you, you know, however you wish to connect with them at first. Uh, my preferred way of doing it is to, um, to you know, contact via social or email before I do a phone call. Um, I think it's a little bit more polite to mm -hmm. um, kind of put a call on the books if you can do it. If you can get into somebody through their inbox or through social, I think it's a less intrusive way of doing it. Um, but at the end of the day, you got to make you got to make phone calls. I mean, you know, not everybody's going to respond, um, so you got to be you know attacking. And not to gloss over this uh, point on intelligence, and to get really practical here for a second, um, you know, in my mind, I'm always looking for trigger events where people have got new jobs, whether there's new products in the market, changes within the company itself. Are there any other bits of intelligence that you uh, you know naturally 100 percent of the time you would go after? Yeah, almost anything that is a, that is kind of like a pre-qualifier. So, you know, BANT, uh, budget authority, need, timing. So there's a lot of different things that can tip you off to whether somebody's pre-qualified on, you know, one of those different areas. Um, like you said, you know, the person changes jobs or the, um, the company raises money. Um, there's a lot of different things that kind of tip off whether they have the budget, whether that person's an authority, whether there's a need, um, whether it's the right timing. Um, so, you know, I'm looking for anything that's going to help me link those two things. So, oh, right, they raised $60 million in funding or, oh, there's an article about the VP of social initiatives talking about how they're going to double down their, you know, Twitter, uh, you know, use or spend or something like that. And I'm a rep that's in that area. Like, that's a beautiful article for me. It tells me exactly who I need to speak to. And it pre-qualifies them. pre-qualifies that one, they're the, they're the decision maker. They're the authority that there's a need for it, that the timing is right, that they have the budget for it. You know, That article right there is gold. And I've seen that exact article before. It was actually an article from Dell uh, maybe like two years ago that I was like, wow, if I was selling this stuff right now, I, this, I'd be all over this. Like, I'd, you know, <laughs> I'd be in this guy's pocket. I'd be, a, I'd be on a flight to his office you know, with a bottle of his you know, favorite wine or something like that, you know, whatever it is. This, this, is, this is a Dell account, and I got everything I need in this one, you know, this one hit. And do you um, think, just to interrupt you there, do you think salespeople do that enough of they get a, a big piece of data like that that is a kick in the ass to get moving and you, your first, well, as you described then, was getting a flight, bottle of champagne uh, or wine or whatever. Do salespeople take action quickly enough on these kind of things? I don't think they do. I mean, that's a pretty drastic action, but if it's a big enough account and my deal size is big enough, like that's what you got to do. Hell yeah. I mean, I know a lot of salespeople um, that would contact reps in a certain city, you know, if you were living in San Francisco and um, you were working maybe a deal or two in Seattle, you send them a message like, hey, I'm going to be in town on Wednesday. Can I take you out to dinner or something like that? You don't have anything booked. But if that person says yes, you know, and they agree to it, you book your flights to Seattle. You know, it's a $200 round trip to get FaceTime with that contact. If that's what you need to do, do that. You know, like you got to, you know, you got to be creative. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I kind of attack in that manner. And why don't um, people do that? Are people just lazy? I don't know if it's laziness. Um, I just don't think people are thinking that way right now. I think, uh, you know, there's a, especially in some of these hyper growth companies, they really want to do more of a, how do I, how do I attack multiple accounts or get into multiple accounts, um, you know, and do something in a scalable manner and less personal touch. And you have to balance both. You have to be able to do both of those things. Um, and it depends. It depends on uh, the deal size, on how kind of crazy you can go with that. And is that a paradox then? Because this is something that we talked about on the show before of, you know, marketers are going after 
uh, with their marketing, marketing automation tools to get this kind of personal touch, but I never really think it works. I think it's all a bit weird. You can tell when your name's been copy and pasted into an email. Salespeople yeah. have the ability to build these relationships, to put these deals together, to add value themselves. And of course, if the salesperson isn't adding value, they've probably be, been replaced by an order form online over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. So is there a paradox there between scalability and sales itself? Should those two words be put in the same sentence? Yeah, I think there's a way that you can do things in a scalable manner while still adding like a high touch um, element to your outreach, um, especially when you're going through email. Um, you know what they what we talk about often is a 10-80-10 rule where your um, the body of your email, the the middle 80 percent, is something that's more generic, but you have multiple common denominators between the people you send that to. So, for example, if I'm going to send an email to uh, the healthcare industry, VPs of sales that all live in Boston, that 80% middle is catered to those three buckets. So that email is still looking personalized to anybody you send it to in those three areas, which out of your, you know, your, you know, your prospect list could be, you know, if you have a you know, couple thousand people on there, maybe this email goes out to 50 or 100 people. The 10%, like the intro line and the 10%, the outro line, those are personalized. And so a lot of the software you can use to send these emails, you can upload that in. It pulls in their name and company and stuff dynamically into the email. But you can also pull in those personalized sentences into the email from that spreadsheet. So basically you have to write 50 intro sentences, 50 outro sentences, and then pick that template, send it. And you've got a pretty personalized email that you're sending to 50 people. And that's the balance between um, scaling and doing it in a kind of hyper-growth manner but also adding that high touch element. And from uh, your experience here, and again, I don't know the answer to this one, is your time better spent doing those 50, uh, 10, 80, 10 kind of split emails? Or would your time be better spent, even though we all hate doing it, writing 10 very specific uh, bespoke emails that yeah. you know you would assume they would get a better response? I think it depends on uh, your territories and how they're broken up. I think it depends on how many reps you have, how far along you are in your company. Um, listen, if you have 20 accounts, you better be super high touch on those 20 accounts. If you know you've got thousands, well, you got to find a way to get through them all and do it in a way where you're still adding that high touch element. You're still, you know, you ha you have to kind of be hunting, um, but it's still, you know, kind of a little bit of like, okay, well, we're still trying to feel our way out here. Um, there's, you know, there's no silver bullet in sales, and you know, in most cases, and, and almost anything you do. Um, the context around understanding, um, you know, the territory size, uh, and you know how fast you want to move, um, will dictate you know how high touch you make those emails. And is email your first step? So you mentioned that you'd email social before trying to get a call. I totally agree. If you can get someone's email address, would you always go there first? Yeah, um, I think I'd go to the inbox, especially you know. One, you want to be adding value. So whatever you're sending out to them, you want to make sure is somewhat valuable, especially in that 80%. Like I said before, if you're talking to healthcare VPs in Boston, in that 80%, you might have like an article that you allude to that's like, hey, you thought you might find this interesting or something like that. So you're adding value in those emails. Um, you want to maybe call attention to that um, when you're connecting with them on LinkedIn, write them a message, connect with them on Twitter, follow them, favorite them, all that kind of stuff. You can actually... You know, allude to that in your intro sentence and your outro sentence. Also, um, you know, hey, saw you tweeting about X, or um, you know, wanted to con continue the conversation. So, so Max, you, let me interrupt yeah. you again. What's the difference here? Again, this is something I struggle with when uh, we're doing different experiments of sale and uh, selling ad space on the podcast. Um, I always, even if something sounds like a stupid idea and I know it's not going to work, I'll try it because then I can write about how rubbish uh, the the advice yeah. or the 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 common most obvious way of going about it was the wrong way to go about it how do you go how do you split and and again you can explain this to me um better than than anyone else i think i've had on the show so far you've got this email that's 10 80 10 yeah. like the goal of the email is just to get the phone call that like, yeah. would you agree with that yeah how do you split an email that has Massive value. This is actually useful, and the prospect opening it goes, "Oh, I'm glad I got this email." How do you differentiate that from the email that we all get when people are trying to sell us stuff, which is 
they've obviously just tried to customize it to make it look like it isn't spam. Yeah. So if you're just customizing it to make it look like it isn't spam, then you're not delivering value. And you're also not hitting them at the right time. So the right time, right person, right message, you're probably going to have a, lot of, a high chance of success. And there's a lot of pre-qualification you can do through your research to see if that's the right person at the right time with the right, right message. So, you know, um, I don't know if you ever heard this story, but it was out in San Francisco. There was a girl selling Girl Scout cookies. She, uh, you know, thought about it in her head, where can I find the right person at the right time and I can serve up my Girl Scout cookies and people are going to be likely to buy. So she goes out front of a marijuana dispensary and she sells 117 boxes of cookies and she breaks the record for most boxes of cookies sold in a day because she had the right person at the right time with the right message. Somebody who just bought you know, their, you know, what they were going to smoke later, they're going to be hungry later, they're going to have the munchies, and she's sitting there with a bunch of boxes of cookies. She made a killing. If she went and did that outside like you know, the vegan gluten-free restaurant <laughs> tried to sell Thin Mints, she wouldn't be very successful because those people can't eat those cookies. Right? So if you do your research and you're pre-qualifying people and you're adding value and you're sending the right email at the right time to the right person, that, when that connects, you're going to be successful. If you're not doing that, if you're not doing the, the front end of that research, I mean I have a team of virtual assistants that basically puts together these dossiers for us that goes out and you know, does that research for me and then I can read through the dossier and say, okay, this, is a, you know, this person, it's the right timing here. This is like a low-hanging fruit. And you can grade those people and send those people even higher touch emails. You can, you know, I, honestly, I think marketing should work with the, the sales development teams that are going on prospecting and, and arming them with that stuff. I, you know, if I am uh, breaking my teams out into territories, my marketing team can you know, arm my sales development team with all the most recent articles and valuable things that are happening in healthcare for our companies right now. Then you know, it's like, that's amazing. All right, well, I'm adding value because I'm surfacing an article that actually is relevant to this person. Um, and um, you know, I'm saying, you know, here's how we relate to this thing. And do you think uh, in the future, in the next two, three years especially, there's going to be a shift that salespeople will have uh, perhaps a team around them. So perhaps there's less salespeople, or ses you know, they might not be called salespeople, whatever they're called, yeah. but they'll have some kind of assistant with them. They'll have uh, someone yeah. from, they're working closely with marketing. They'll have someone to do some of the the mundane aspects of this, of like gathering well, emails and that kind of seeing, thing. You're already seeing people adding, you know, data science, business analysts, even sales enablements like, a pretty new role. So sales ops and sales enablement. Sales ops used to be, you know, a Salesforce admin basically. Somebody just going through like the data and cleaning it up. And now there's an actual stack of technology that can be built on top of, you know, in, into your entire sales stack, they call it. All this technology that the sales teams are using. So that's a pretty new role. Um, or not a new role, but becoming much more prominent in a lot of these companies uh, with a, uh, a much more necessary, you know, obviously, um, in a lot of these tech companies that are leveraging technology. Then there's sales enablement, which you know, is almost like that hybrid between product marketing and um, you know, creating this content and building out this collateral and um, getting these links you know, and, and articles and content to feed to the uh, sales development team. So it's already happening. But the, the main thing is a lot of companies are now building to help these sales reps um, you know, through artificial intelligence, through machine learning, and through you know, scraping the web, finding content that's relevant, um, surfacing that easily for them to, you know, plug and play. So, um, you know, here's an article we think that, you know, this batch of people would find interesting. Um, here's an article that mentions X, Y, and Z. You should go target this person right now. There's technology out there that's, you know, that's already existing and it's going to be mainstream, you know, in the next two, three years. And tell us what you mean by a sales stack. For some people listening who aren't in tech sales, who aren't in San Francisco, New York, this might be a new term to them. Just yeah. give us a, just a brief overview of what you mean by that. Yeah, so, you know, you're a sales rep. You probably have LinkedIn. You probably have a CRM. But then there's a lot of different pieces, layers of technology that can go in and you can help you, you know, close deals. So there's obviously... Um, email sales automation tools and whether you use that for email automation or you use it for tracking um, it's still incredibly valuable so you know I would use it to um, upload a list of prospects email addresses um, pick a template obviously customize that template um, pull in the dynamic field send the email track the open rates track the click-throughs track the response rates things like that 
track the positive responses versus negative responses, see what people are saying. But there's technology that allows you to do that now. There's technology that allows you to see how people like to interact with each other before you even contact that person. There's technology that um, you know, helps you understand how to contact someone on LinkedIn, how to contact someone on Twitter, auto follow, auto DM, all this kind of stuff uh, that's out there. All this can go into basically your stack of sales technology that builds on top of your CRM and helps you close deals. Um, much of this you know, is kind of enhancing and um, in some ways semi-automating the uh, sales process. Doesn't mean that there's no need for a human anymore. There's definitely more than ever a need for a human. Um, why? But why is there more than ever a need for a human? Because people buy from people, and so you know, with more technology that's out there these days, um, people still have this kind of distrust with the technology. People don't. A lot of the technology that's out there that's being sold, the market still needs to be educated. So. People not only need to sell something to somebody, but they actually need to sell them on the entire market, like the entire reason why this product exists. So if you look at these, even these email sales automation companies, that market didn't exist three years ago, four years ago. Now they're creating that market. They're selling them on like why you need to buy a product in this area and then why you need to be, buy our product. Before you just had to sell your product. You know, you sell tires, you know, people know that you need tires, like buy our tires. But right now, you know, people are actually selling whole new markets that are cre being created, educating people on you know, why it's so necessary, and then you have to sell your product. And you know what? A lot of small companies are being created because of it because the big companies that raise a ton of money spend a lot of it on, on educating the market, and then that person gets educated on the market, the buyer gets educated on the market, and they say, okay, well, I'm going to do my diligence. And maybe they buy one of the smaller, you know, they buy one of the, the tools from the smaller companies. So... Um, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to see what's going on. Good stuff. Max, before you tell us a little bit about your book, I've got a couple of questions I ask everyone that comes on the show. First one I'm going to hit you with, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Oof, world's greatest salesperson. Um, whoever our next president's going to be, because that is a uh, pretty incredible trick, something that they're pulling off, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, most of the times people in government, um, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, you can look at someone like that. They are incredible at sales. I mean, that's pretty much their entire job is to basically sell them votes. You know, you got to get the vote. So We did a whole show on this the other day, and yeah. I, I still don't quite understand how they do it, but I love the fact, and I can only talk about British politics rather than Americans specifically, but the selling uh, like intangible ideas and concepts yeah. that you know they're not going to do half of them once they're in power anyway. Yep. And you know, I don't know, it's just, you've just, they're in a weird situation where they're just trying to beat the other person. They're, they're just trying to, they're selling the other person, they're selling that the other person is a, a poor option as much as they're selling themselves as to be a good one. Yeah. But I mean, you know, watch like any of Bill Clinton's debates from back in the day. Like, I mean, he's, he's the ultimate, I mean, that guy can sell. You know, uh, even you know, Obama's a smooth talker. These these people that run for president, they're you know, they're running the country. They're they're smooth talkers. They're great salesmen. I mean, they 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 figured out a way to to sell those votes. Good stuff. Next one, and we touched on this just before we hit record, so uh, you might want to go back over that again. But what motivates you personally to close more deals? Uh, well, being a sales guy, you know, I'm coin operated, so obviously, you know, cash at the end of the tunnel is always a, a good motivator. Um, and, and why cash? Is this just a game? Because, you know, obviously you're, you're successful. You get to a certain point where, uh, you know, cash and uh, the, the science suggests you get to a certain point where more cash per year doesn't make that much difference to happiness. And I'm intrigued. As, that was the first thing you said then. And it makes total sense. But why more cash? Is it what you're doing with it? Is it that it's a game and there's a success element to it? Yeah, I think there's a success element. It's, you know, I, I grew up playing hockey and, you know, I wanted to win games and score goals. And, you know, you get the win when you get the deal closed. And what's even more important is that it's a win-win. Like, you know, for us doing sponsorships for a company that I run, I want to make sure that when we, cl when we close a sponsor that they're happy, they, we over-deliver and that they're going to come back multiple times because it's not about the it's not about the first deal it's not about the first sponsorship that they pay for it's about the sponsorships they pay for after that so while it's like you know it's fun to 
you know, to get the W or close a deal or, you know, count the money or whatnot, it's more fun to see when they're successful and that, when that grows. And, you know, I sold for other people before when it wasn't my company and, you know, you, you get the commission check or, um, you know, the company grows and you have equity or something like that. And then, you know, that's all fun too. But when it's your company and you see the company grow and you see more people buy into your baby and they're like, you know, they're interested in it and now they're invested in it, you know, that's fun. Even if it's, you know, the, the cash part's cool, but the fact that they put some skin in the game on you, on what you're building, you know, that means a lot, you know, and uh, you don't want to let them down. You want them, I, you know, I tell my sponsors, you know, okay, you're going to make a, a bunch of money on this event and then when, whatever you make, you're going to reinvest and, uh, you know, reinvest half of it even. And, you know, hopefully we can just keep making money together for a long time. Good stuff. Final one from me, Max. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at sales? <sighs> oh, um, so I went to college, Arizona State, you know, average college in the U.S., uh, was an architecture major oh, wow. and, and switched uh, in 2007, 2008, the housing market crash. So switched to a, like a BIS, you know, uh, Bachelor of Interdisciplinary Studies degree. So um, if I would have known better and known what, what I was going to do, I would have done my degree in psychology. Um, there are barely any colleges in the U.S. that teach even a single class in sales, yet you can get a marketing degree at pretty much all of them. Um, but the closest thing, I think, to you know, a sales degree is um, psychology. If you, can, if you can really pay attention and really study psychology and you know, even taking like speech and debate um, classes, I mean, those are two things probably, speech and debate and psychology, that if I could have gone back in time and, and really just you know, shit. I mean, you have all the time in the world when you're young. And, and would you definitely have stuff. gone back to college or would have you would you have jumped into business sooner? Because that's a, a debatable thing that I, I think about. I don't know. You know, I, you know, you can sit here and say, you know, what would I tell myself or what would you do all day long? But like, I'm pretty happy with where I am right now and I don't know that I'd be here if I did anything else different. So, sure. you know, it's one of those things. Um, you know, if I can go back in time, what would I tell myself? I'd tell myself to take all the money I had and bet on Leicester City <laughs> season. And, you know, 5,000 to one odds. Uh, hell yes. 10,000, maybe $100,000 on that. Well, you know, you're walking out with some good money right there. So, you know, screw everything else. That's what I would go tell my, my younger self. Good 2016, stuff. 2016. 2015. 2015. Yeah. Max. August. That's, what, that's where you put your money. That's what you do. Tell us a little bit about the book and where the audience can find out more about you as well. Yeah, so you can find out more about me. Um, obviously, I'm Twitter, uh, Max Alts, M-A-X-A-L-T-S, and then saleshacker.com for all things um, B2B sales, future of sales, the next generation of sales is what we're talking about. Um, so technologies, uh, people, psychology, everything. And then, um, you know, just wrote a book, Hacking Sales, that comes out uh, May 31st. Uh, via Wiley. Um, you can go to hackingsales.com and pick up a copy. Um, would love it if you got it um, on pre order, obviously. And um, we have a conference coming up called Sales Machine that we're doing in conjunction with, in a partnership with Salesforce. Uh, so that'll be a big one. 2,000 people, a lot of enterprise there. We got Gary Vaynerchuk, Simon Sinek, Seth Godin, Ariana Huffington, Frederick Eklund, Billy Bean, all speaking at that, um, sandwiching about 20 sessions from sales practitioners and customer success, sales development, sales enablement operations, and uh, sales leadership. So uh, that'll be awesome. So, um, you know, if you can grab a copy of the book, um, definitely reach out to me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, connect with me, and uh, look forward to um, having everyone involved in the uh, Sales Hacker Network. We'll link to all of that in the show notes over at salesman.red for anyone who is frantically scribbling notes on the palm of their hand now in the car or uh, struggling to scribble down anything on the treadmill as they're sweating away. And with that, Max, I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me. And there we have it. Thank you, Max, for coming on the show. Massively appreciate it. I'm pretty sure Max will be on in the near future as well to follow up on some of the points that we talk about in this episode. And of course, Sales Nation, without you, there is no show. And so I massively appreciate your time. Thank you for tuning in. And I will speak with you all again tomorrow.